Well, I ask him if he would, and he certainly has all. Thank you. I'm sorry. They shut me down altogether. That way I'll turn it on. I appreciate that. Well, it's one way to get my attention. When uh, I announced that I was going to present this lesson, it's interesting how quickly people will tell you what they think about it. Even uh, over the past week or so, as I have uh, announced that I wanted to speak on this subject tonight, several of you uh, uh, have taken the opportunity to tell me and to give me some of your ideas about this. And I'm glad about that. I appreciate that. But as I said, this is a, an interesting topic. Uh, interesting may not be the right word, but it's a topic that I think is always timely because of the nature of alcohol and the nature of those who seek to be followers of God. If I took a poll tonight in this assembly and I ask about whether or not you believe a Christian can or should drink alcohol, I believe that the survey, even in this audience, would be mixed. Uh, I know several of you, uh, and I, don't, I know most all of you, but I don't know all of you as intimately as others. But I know that some of you have faced difficulty with this subject. You have fought this subject. You have fought alcohol. Others of you are trying to decide maybe how you feel about it and whether or not what kind of uh, conclusions that you need to reach. But if I ask you, do you think a Christian should get drunk? I'm pretty confident that in this audience, the answer to that would be unanimous. I'm pretty confident that this audience would say, no, I don't believe a, a Christian should do that. And so what we face then when we talk about the Christian and alcohol, we, we, we face how we feel about certain things, hopefully based upon what we believe the Bible to teach. And it's really not what we believe. College View doesn't have a position about that. Now, I may have a position and you may have a position, and that's important because each of us has to determine how we feel about the subject. So tonight what I want to do is share my biblical conclusions with you tonight. And I hope these conclusions give you something to consider. That's exactly what I want to do, what I always want to do. And I hope that as a result of that, uh, you maybe can reach even and solidify even more some conclusions that you have. I probably won't answer all your questions. I'm fairly confident I won't do that. And part of the reason why I won't do that is because I haven't answered all my questions. But I do believe that the things that we discuss tonight will be beneficial. I know of no Christian who would argue that intoxication, addiction, and disease isn't a reason to not drink. I don't know anybody who would argue that that's a reason. But there are some who see nothing wrong with social drinking or engaging in some level of controlled consumption. And the reason why that there are people, not just New Testament Christians, but even just believers in Jesus Christ, the reason that there are some who believe in some level of controlled consumption is because the Bible never condemns all consumption of alcohol. And I believe that's true. I believe the Bible doesn't condemn all consumption. I don't know how you react to that. I don't know if you think, well, that's not what I believe about that or whether it is what you believe about that. But the fact that the Bible doesn't condemn all consumption, in my judgment, is true. When we address a topic like this, we need complete honesty. That is absolutely the way. We need to be as transparent with this subject or any subject that we undertake when we're thinking about what God wants. Fairness and accurateness... It's not about what I want to hear. And may I suggest tonight that you, if you have already reached some conclusions about this, that's not wrong. That's good. I think it's good. But, but let me ask you tonight to just think with me and just try to, try to do away with those conclusions that you've already reached. And just give some heed to the things that I'm going to say tonight. Either way, 
and try to hear as objectively as you can. And as I said, this topic deserves honesty, as does all Bible subjects. It really, any subject that we talk about, if we're serious about finding an answer to it, we need to try to be honest about what it is that we believe. And so, I want us to think about this tonight. A lot of times people who believe that some controlled consumption of alcohol is good and is right and is okay, maybe that's a better way to say that, will point to some passages like this passage in Psalm 104, 15 that says, And wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Wine and food are gifts from God. That's what the passage tells us. And so they look at a passage like this and they say, you know, well, here, here's, here is wine that's put in a positive light. Or they go to a passage like this in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 7 that says, Go, eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. That seems like that, if not promotes it, certainly allows that kind of thing to be taking place in the lives of people who are good and godly people. That's what the wisdom writer would say. Or a, or a passage like this in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. Where Paul says to Timothy, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And I think we've all heard this passage, and we've all, I think, understand this passage in the sense of there may be for some health benefit and for some health reason, at least in the first century, Paul would indicate that as he talks to Timothy and as he gives some advice about that. And so that's a passage that sometimes people use to talk about. The benefits of drinking alcohol. And an honest person, I think, is forced to agree that some passages talk about this in a positive way. We, we, we sometimes talk about Jesus in John 2. As Jesus turned the water into wine. We weren't there. We don't know everything about that. But I believe that good scholarship, folks, I believe that good scholarship, if we're really going to be fair about this, sometimes people say, well, what Jesus just turned that into was grape juice. I don't believe that's the case. I believe what Jesus, if good scholarship is such, and I believe it is, I think what the conclusion that we can reach is what Jesus turned the water into was what was prevalent then, the wine that was prevalent then. And I think even in here, this is wine. This is not grape juice or some unfermented wine. That's my conclusion about that. I may be wrong about that, but that is my conclusion. The question to do with this passage and other passages is to make, what, it, what should we make about this and the use of alcohol in our society? And how, how do we engage in that? Are we talking about the same things? And I think a superficial reading of the Bible may say, well, all these things point to a Christian being able to use alcohol. But I'm going to say something that I think is hinges on everything. What we're talking about wine to be then and what we're talking about wine to be now are not the same thing. You have probably heard that a lot in preaching, in this pulpit, and in other places. But we're not talking about nearly the same thing when we're talking about wine in the first century and when we're talking about wine today. If those passages are your proof text or if they're my proof text, I don't think we're comparing apples to oranges. Or rather, apples to apples. I think we're comparing apples to oranges. And so, my, my point tonight as we think about this is, why would I say that? Well, let me suggest this. The consumption of wine in the Bible was the consumption of a common, everyday table beverage. Archaeologists have uncovered multiple, multiple wine presses in ancient Israel. This is just depicts one of those things. And, and you can't read it, I, I doubt. But, but anyway, the, what is said to the left is a wine press in ancient Israel. It talks about where the treading floor was. And it talks about the vats where the juice would, would actually pour into. And how the natural fermenting process would only take, even just in a couple of days, the firm, fermenting process would, would begin. Water supplies were very often tainted with stagnation. They were, they were tainted with disease. They were tainted with other unhealthy fields. And so frankly, drinking water was quite dangerous. And drinking sometimes daily was often wine. Very often and most often it was this common table beverage that we're talking about. These wine presses produced wine. 
There really was no other kind. Somebody says, well, it wasn't fermented. Well, I, I tend to disagree with that. The fermentation process really happened quite quickly, taking only a few days. Some have tried to argue against this, but we're not just talking about grape juice here. I think we need, if we're going to be careful and if we're going to be honest, we need to state what it is. We need to be fair and accurate. It was near impossible to prevent some degree of fermentation. Table beverages had a degree of fermentation. But what we must remember is that the alcoholic content in beverages then is nothing really compared to the alcoholic content of beverages today. We're talking about apples to oranges. We're not talking about the same thing. Ancient beverages... Ancient wines especially were greatly diluted with water. Ancient writers talk about this. Three parts water, most often to one part wine. In many cases, five parts water to one part wine. I, wanna, I want you to notice a passage. This is in, in the intertestamental period. In, in 2 Maccabees chapter 15 and verse 39, the ancient, writer, ancient Jewish writer said this about writing the end of the Jewish history at that period of time, he said this, he said, So I will hear in my story, if it is well told and to the point, that is what I myself desire. If it was poorly done and mediocre, that was the best I can do. For just as it is harmful to drink wine alone and water alone, while wine mixed with water is sweet and enhances one's enjoyment, so also the style of the story delights the ear of those who read the Word. What this writer is really saying is, you, you, you had, in, in that day and age, you had to have both for the beverage to be pleasing. He understood the mixture. He understood the purpose of that. And so what he's saying here is, is I'm, I'm giving the facts of the story, I'm giving the facts in a pleasing way. I'm mixing several things to get where it needs to be. He understood that in terms of even the wine of the day, the, the table beverage of the day. And so I think it's important for us to understand that the, the table wine was never intended to induce an effect on the body to lead to intoxication or anything close to it. That, that wasn't the intent. The intent was to have something to drink that was pleasing that would not basically not get one sick. And so that was the table beverage of the day. The Bible does talk about strong drink. There's no doubt about that. When we talk about that, we're talking about the consumption of a strong drink in the Bible was undiluted drink intended for a different purpose. As you read and as you study that, when you talk about things different than this common table beverage, you're talking about things whose, whose designation was for a different purpose, and that's the point here. This passage in Proverbs 23 indicates such as the wisdom writer says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. You know, strong drink, even in the first century, created bad outcomes. And the wisdom writers knew that. And if you engage in that activity for the purpose of, 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 of putting yourself in that position, that was going to happen. That was definitely going to happen. And today's alcohol has a much higher concentration, mainly, mainly because of the invention of the distillation process. I don't understand how all of that works. The distillation process was developed around 17 or 700 A.D. in Arab countries. It worked its way to Europe around 1100 A.D. And as you probably know, as you're familiar with, just because of, of how prevalent it is in our world, the distillation process allows fermentation to occur at a much higher rate. So that there is a higher percentage of alcoholic content in that beverage 
rather than the natural fermenting process taking place. And, it, and the natural process would take place. It would begin soon after grapes were be, began, began to be smashed. That process would begin soon after that. But later on, the distillation process made drinks more alcoholic very quickly. So yes, there is and was a difference. Well, some would say, well, you know, Kenny, here, here's the deal with me. You're talking about strong drink. You're talking about hard liquor. And I, and I don't do that. I don't drink hard liquor. Matter of fact, well, you know, I may just drink a glass of wine. Or I may just drink a can of beer. And I, let me suggest something to you. While it is true that there is a difference in the level of alcohol in various alcoholic beverages, the distillation process may be different. The kind of drink that it is may be different. The normal portion that a person drinks is higher even if we're talking about beer and wine. One mixed drink that's 80 proof, such as rum or brandy or gin or vodka, in, a, in what we typically might see on television, someone drinking out of a, out of sometimes we call it a shot glass, has the same amount of alcohol as a 5-ounce glass of wine or a 12-ounce can of beer. And really all I want you to understand is, is that sometimes we may try to defend a certain thing and yet it's, that's a difficult thing for us to do. And I will be the first to tell you, I don't understand this from personal experience. It, 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 alcohol is one thing in my life that has, has, at least to this point in my life, has never been a temptation to me. But I know that's different for some of you. This quote from a book by Robert Stein in, in, that was in his book Wine Drinking in New Testament Times. It, this is this statement that I'm about to make that he made. It's a little graphic in terms of the ultimate outcome, but I think it makes, uh, makes a pretty good argument when we think about this. He said, to consume the amount of alcohol that is in two martinis by drinking wine as it was in ancient times, even at three to one, would have, one would have to drink over 22 glasses. In other words, it is possible to become intoxicated from wine mixed with water, but one's drinking would probably affect the bladder long before it affected the mind. Why deal with all this? Well, I think because what the Bible reasons about in the use of wine isn't reason to drink even socially. And I'm not trying to mix social drinking with drinking alcohol in general, but for most of us, we're probably talking about drinking it socially. That may be what we're dealing with. And some of you may just simply be saying, well, what is the problem with just drinking it socially? Well, I think that if you just stop and put some things together, I think the conclusions at least that I reach would tell me that's not a wise thing to do. It's a very unwise thing to do. This is Thomas Welch. His son, his grandson, and his grandson's son. Thomas Welch, in 1869, began producing what we commonly, the beverage we commonly enjoy, just grape juice. He began producing that, as I said, uh, and, and this was without the natural fermentation process and without distillation. And what we call that is we call that grape juice. He had a passion, which is interesting to me, of why he began that. He had a passion to serve God by helping the church give communion by using the fruit of the vine rather than what he would call the cup of devils. That was his initial reason for trying to produce something like this, which most of us, if not all of us, typically do enjoy. I will tell you that... Uh, I have communed with Christians in this country and abroad most of the time drinking this type of juice, but on at least a couple of occasions drinking juice that was not grape juice. It was fermented wine. I'm thankful to Mr. Welch for what he developed. And I think all ought to be. There, there are a lot of things in terms of statistics. I, I didn't even give you any statistics or anything like that. I think we're all familiar with probably statistics. And quite frankly, those things change on a daily basis. 
But I want you just to think with me tonight for a few minutes about some considerations I think that all of us ought to have in reference to how, we, how we're going to deal with this. What's going, to be my, uh, what's going to be my conclusion about what I do? Well, let, let me mention just a few things to you tonight. And I want to make some applications as well. We, we just must be sure that we don't associate Bible alcohol as the same thing as modern day alcohol. We just can't do that. Not, not and be good scholars. We can't do that. We can't say, well, they did it then. And, we, and so that gives us license to do it now. We can't do that, folks. We're not talking about the same thing. And I think that's a point that that obviously we've discussed. And I want to drive home because I think that's critically important. And then let me mention this. We don't need to ignore the warnings of alcohol and what it is associated with. The Bible passages that give warnings do so realizing how easy it is to abuse what is not just a simple table beverage. Let, let, me, let me mention something that, that I think is associated. This passage in Galatians 5 is, is pretty clear. Let me, just, let me just read it to you and we'll make a couple of comments. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, And the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And very quickly, some people will say, well, well, Kenny, I don't drink to drunkenness. This is not talking about me. Or they may say, you know, I I, I hold my liquor. If if, if I'm drinking something harder, or even if I'm not drinking something harder, but something that that has a high content of alcohol, I can handle that. I want to ask you a question. How many people who are intoxicated and who are alcoholics and who on a regular basis or one time engage in drunkenness, how many of those people have said and I don't drink to get drunk. And I don't drink, and, and I drink only to the point where I can hold what I drink so that it doesn't face me. How many people have said that? And you may be saying, that's not a legitimate argument. I think it's a very legitimate argument. How many people have said that? One of my closest friends on earth, who's still alive, fortunately. That's told me a story that has stuck with me for years. He is a wonderful Christian. He lived in a larger city. He was fairly well-to-do. A fairly affluent person from an affluent family could have whatever he wanted. And he's told me many times about the night when he remembers standing at a 7-Eleven begging people for money. Begging people for money to buy alcohol at that convenience store. Thinking about if I don't get what it is that I want, that this may be the time to end my life. Telling telling me this very thing. Having the ability even on that occasion to do that. And when I have questioned him further about that. It didn't take any questioning. He was very willing to tell me this. He said, he said, the thing that started me on this path was at 14 years old, a friend of mine invited me to his house when his parents were gone. We went down to their basement and tasted for the very first time homemade peach wine. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You talk to my friend today, He will tell you, absolutely, you avoid it at all cost. Do not begin. Do not even start that. There is no such thing, he would say, as a harmless drink of alcohol on any level at any time. That's his conclusion based upon what's happened to him. Another consideration is this. Is is only drunkenness condemned in Scripture? Well, we, we know it is. I don't think there's anyone here tonight who would say, well, it's not condemned. I think everybody here would say that. But I want you to think about this this statement that's made in Galatians 5 and verse 21. When he talks about the works of the flesh, he goes on to say, drunkenness and revelries. 
Some translations call those drinking parties or some translations call those carousings. I want to tell you something, folks. You need to be very careful about how you argue. If, 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 you're, if you think that there is a way in which you can engage in the use of alcohol to whatever degree, I want you to be very careful about those arguments. You may convince yourself that you can do that, and I'm going to tell you that that is your business. You've got to reach that conclusion for yourself. If you're going to reach that, you've got to do that for yourself. But when you look at passages like this that talk about being drunk and talk about those things that relate to that, those carousings and drinking parties, what the New Testament is talking about are, are those situations in which people gather together and they engage in these kind of things that have to do with drinking, that have to do with partying. They're called that because those are the kind of things that are associated with those kind of events. Alcohol is associated with those kind of events. We're not talking about cake and ice cream parties here. You all know that. We're talking about Paul saying through inspiration, you know, revelries are a work of the flesh. When you're around those who are engaging in that kind of activity... When you're around those situations where that kind of activity is taking place, you need to think about that. Drinking parties are called that very thing because of the alcohol that's there and because there are things that relate to that thing. Honesty demands that we say the way it is, and that's the way that is. And since we're in a university town, let's be very transparent. College parties are seldom parties that deal with cake and ice cream or anything that relates to what a Christian ought to be engaged in. Let's be real honest about that, my friends. Now, what about someone's presence at a party like that? What, what about someone's presence at a drinking party at carousing? Here's a typical response that I get from some people, and I've gotten it from some people here. I don't drink. I may mean, go to that kind of thing, but I don't drink. And may I just simply say to you, well, that's good that you don't. But you're there. You're there, and you're not wearing a shirt that says, I don't drink, I'm a Christian. I'm not trying to make light of that. But not everybody there understands that. You are part of that scene. And in, 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 in their minds, you're in essence condoning what they're doing. You may say you're not, but I, don't, I find it hard to believe that, that, you're, that you don't understand that. If you're part of groups, may I, let me say this. I'm going to be very transparent about this. You're part of groups that have or host these type of events. May I suggest that you rethink your choices? Make sure your motives and your actions are motivated by what is right and what is good and what is best. I cannot decide for you. I've had people come to me and I appreciate it. I do. I've had some of our college population come and others of you have come and they want, they want my opinion about this and I'm glad to give it. I appreciate them asking me. And I try to be as honest and upfront as I can about what it is that, that I need to say to them. Because I cannot decide for you, nor you me. But I do want you to think carefully. Drink, drinking alcohol has so many vices that are attached to it. I just want you, I'm just, I'm just going to mention these. And, and, and you may be sitting there as I go over these, you may say, Ken, well, that's the point. That is, what you're about to talk about, that's the point. And it may be the point. But again, everybody's got to make these decisions for themselves. The verbal and physical abuse that comes from a person who attaches himself or herself to alcohol are monumental. They're all over the place. Verbal abuse and physical abuse. Again, in my own family, I have not been... I have not seen that, but I have talked to and I have seen it in other people's family to the point where I'm tired of it. 
Some of you have dealt with it. Some of you are dealing with it. And you know what I'm talking about. The sexual immorality that attaches itself to that kind of thing. It's something that a Christian must give serious thought to. It's hard to, to be involved in, in those kind of situations and, and some of these other things not eventually find themselves there. It's hard. That's hard to do. Vehicular homicides. Those driving under the influence. And while there may, there may, a, may be a practical side to that, just think about what, uh, what would a, how would a Christian deal with that? Poor judgment. I realize that, that you know, I, I can't sit here and tell you at what point your judgment is impaired because you have had, been drinking alcohol. I can't tell you that. I don't know what that is. But I know it takes place. And then there's this issue of a, of a poor influence. For, for someone to tell me, for someone to look me straight in the eye and with a straight face say, well, I can drink and my influence will not be made negative. I don't believe that, not for a minute. I don't. Now, there may be situations where, that, where that, 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 that doesn't work, but for the most part, in my mind, in almost any situation, for a person to say, I'm going to drink and my influence is not going to become negative, I just don't see that happening anytime. Amen. And we need to be aware of that, folks. If we're really going to be people who are going to serve God, we have to make sure that our influence, that our light can shine and that we're the salt of the earth. We can't do that engaged in this kind of activity. And I'm going to be very pointed. There are some here in this audience who have lost your influence. A lot of it because of situations that have been posted on social media in which you've engaged in that kind of activity. You need to think about it. If you want to be seen as a person who has faith, I'm not, I'm not questioning your heart I'm questioning judgment that says, listen, you know, I can still engage in this and I can be and do whatever I want to do. I, I, I just don't see how, how that can happen. I don't see how God can be pleased with that. Broken marriages. How many times in my lifetime have, have I and have many of you talked to a husband or a wife who, who comes to you... Uh, but because you, you, don't understand, you don't know what to do because that spouse is unwilling to yield because alcohol has, has become addictive to that person. And that's happened because that first drink was drunk. Now let me say this. If you're looking for someone to condone your drinking, you're going to find it. You're not going to have to look far. If you're looking for someone to tell you, listen, engaging in the drinking of alcohol is okay under certain conditions. You can find that. And I'm going to tell you. Can I stand before you in this pulpit and tell you that the drinking of any alcohol all the time is a sin? I can't do it. I can't do that. If you want to know how, have my honest opinion about that, I can't do that, folks. But I want to tell you something. You're going to have to use very good judgment. And you're going to have to make what I believe are principles found in Scripture. You're going to have to work those pretty strongly to reach a conclusion other than that. What am I going to do? I'm going to abstain. What am I going to encourage you to do? I'm going to encourage you to abstain for a variety of reasons. I want you to think about one other thing tonight. If you're, if you're not sure about how you feel about that, here's what I'd like to ask you to do. I want you to go find... Five, ten people that you believe are strong Christians. 
I'd like to ask you to, to do it. Let's have, have a little wisdom. Have your group have a little wisdom. Have a little age to it. But pick you some of those folks out that you, that you don't know how they feel about. But I want you to pick them out and I want you to go to them and I want you to ask them. What do you think about a Christian and alcohol? Go to them. And find out how they feel about that. Since I announced that I wanted to preach this lesson, three people in this church, in this local church, have come to me. And they've said, I've struggled with it. It still is an attempt, a temptation to me. And all three have said, let me preach the lesson. You know why they say that? Every single one of them says, avoid it at all costs. Does that make them right? No. Does that make me right? Do, do, are my conclusions, what, what, are the, all the conclusions that God wants everybody to reach? No. Not necessarily. I hope that these conclusions are good and that they're accurate and I have been fair. But every single one of us has to make that decision for ourselves, folks. When my youngest son was 13, he went with his baseball team to Cooperstown. Some of you in this audience have made that trip with your son. I stayed in a house with two dads during that trip. We rented a house for about four or five days. Each night after the games were over, those other two men would go into town. And they would do what you would expect maybe men who had those backgrounds to do. And I can remember the last night them asking me if, if they called me later on, would I come and get them? I said, no, I will not. And I can remember about 3 a.m., I can remember lying in my bed. And one of the men with whom I was sharing a room came in in the middle of the night and crawled in bed. And I can remember about 20 minutes after that, I can remember him getting up. And me thinking, that's what drinking is about. The difficulties that he had. I, I, I will never forget it. Now, that's easy for us to see. Well, if, you, if you had seen, and you, I'm sure you have, but if you saw what I saw that night, it would be easier for you to say, I'm not drinking. But from that point all the way back to when a person begins that process, at what point does engaging in drinking at any level, at any time, in any kind of way, what level does that make any sense at all if you're trying to be a follower of Jesus Christ? I know their questions. I told you when I started this, there are questions in my mind, but they're not really hard questions. And so I would encourage all of us to use uh, good judgment, but use good judgment based on the principles we find in the Word of God. Is this an easy lesson? It's not hard. It's not really a hard lesson, I don't think. Because everybody has to deal with it. I mean, it, that may, again, that may not affect you, but, but there are going to be people you know that are affected by this. So I want all of us to give some thought to it. And this is not the first time you've heard a lesson about this. I'm confident, even from this pulpit, you've heard many lessons. And, and you may have heard lessons from people who have reached different conclusions than I have for different reasons. But the responsibility that each of us has is to try to look into God's Word and say, what is it that I'm trying to do? What is it that I'm trying to be? And how's the best way for me to accomplish that? I hope that the lesson will be helpful to you. Let me say this. If you, you have questions or if you'd like to talk to me further about that, that's fine. If you have other questions you want to ask me, that's fine. I'll give you what I think is good principles to follow from God's Word. But I hope that the lesson will be helpful to you. As it, I think it has been to me. Again, to go back and look at these kind of things. If you have a spiritual need tonight, we're going to sing a song as we always do. And if you would like to make that need known to us, come as we stand and as we sing.